This event and book launch is part of our online Conversations That Matter series, welcoming thought leaders and doers to share their ideas and work. Tonight, we are joined by Alan Moore, who will be drawing on years of research from some of the most pioneering and progressive businesses on the planet, what Alan would describe as beautiful businesses. And Alan is joined by Sir Tim Smith, founder of renowned and much loved Eden Project. We're delighted to be hosting this event with the Do Book Company, an independent publisher based in East London, whose latest publication, Do Build, How to Make and Lead a Business the World Needs by Alan is out today, and this is the launch. So many congratulations, Alan. Um, Alan's new book forms part of their collection of beautifully produced concise guides designed to inspire action and positive change, all written by leading experts. We'll be adding links to their website in the chat, so please do look out for that. Um, and bookshop.org is also where you can get hold of Alan's book, along with a special discount code for this evening's attendees. Before I hand over to Alan and Tim, because we've got so many new people joining us tonight, I'd just like to say a few words about Hawkwood. So um, Hawkwood is a place-based organization um, based just outside of Stroud in Gloucestershire. And we have a growing national and international significance as a place which offers opportunities for those in the cultural sector, for those in business and people in education, connecting them with global thinkers in sustainability and well-being. Our beneficiaries include people who come to Hawkwood to learn for business away days, alongside artists and change makers who come to nurture their thinking and creative endeavors. We have three main strands to our program. We have a place to grow, which runs over 200 short residential educational courses a year. And this year we've taken those, uh, resident, those courses online to reach a wider audience. We also welcome over 100 artists a year to create work. Many of those works that are created are brand new and go on to the national stage. And finally, we are a place for conversation where we bring together people to our events like our Seed Festival that I know Tim came to a few years ago and our other evening talks. In 2019, we worked with over 20,000 people and welcomed 5,000 participants on site for over 28 countries. And since the pandemic has struck, we've had to really adapt and change our way of working and now have a, a growing online presence. However, the pandemic has had a um, severe impact on our ability to operate as a charity, as it has for many organisations. And this event tonight is brought to you by Gift Economy. And if you're able to support our charity, please uh, do donate via our website. Thank you very much for your support. Now, we have um, a wonderful lineup of conversations that matter. This one tonight is very, very special, but we have coming up a wonderful event on International Women's Day on Monday with Natalie Fee um, and also Tracy Lewis, co-founder of Catalyze Change and Sustainability Business Expert. On March the 25th, we have United Nations and TEDx speaker Jazz O'Hara, who is the founder of the Worldwide Tribe. Um, an organization, an online community raising awareness for the Red Fugee crisis. And then on the 29th of April, we're inviting Joshua Coombs, founder of the philanthropic movement, Do Something for Nothing. So I hope you will join us at further events in the future at Hawkwood. And in the meantime, I can't wait to hand you over to Alan Moore and Tim Smith for tonight's conversation that matters. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tim. Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure that I'm going to be having a, a chat with um, uh, Alan, putting him on the spot. Uh, what a remarkable thing to write a book so short um, and it's readable. And we were joking beforehand, it's in big print, so it's great for people like me. Um, and it has enough cheek and, uh, you know, if you like, he's not a Cockney. Well, I don't think he is, but enough Cockney wit to actually know that he has uh, an enormous ability to see the profoundly ridiculous in most things. Uh, but underneath it is a really serious message, which is about how can we reimagine businesses of the future in such a way that doesn't feel like a bunch of earnest people that are filled up with um, jargon, but people who actually realize that businesses are what are going to actually enable us to transform the world, uh, as it seems that government is no longer capable of doing so. Um, so we're going to have 
the conversation which I'll be interrupted at a certain point of questions and it will be handed over to even more sensible people, the audience, uh, to perhaps dig him in the ribs even more. But I can thoroughly, genuinely recommend this book. It is very, very good. We're going to be talking now, from now on, about Spaceship Earth. And Alan, um, first of all, welcome to your own show and thank you for inviting me to um, uh, to, to be your host, if that isn't the right way. I know that um, we were joking before the show that um, uh, we seem to, we may have been separated at birth. We have so many similar <laughs> interests. Um, but what I think would be great to share would be in perhaps two minutes, could you describe, because I've, I've been refreshing my mind on no straight, uh, no straight tracks and um, the do design and the do build books, reading them back to back to read them as if they were music going on at once. And there's a definite evolution in your thinking. And if I was to say that the first two were kind of like Michelangelo doing a, a few sketches, and then the third one, hyperbole allowed, um, is basically you realize you're getting older, you might not have many years left, and you better get it out, you know, the really important stuff. Not that you're looking peaky, I didn't mean it that way, but it, you now may be intellectually um, at your peak. So prove it. Well, thank you. Um, yes, I think that uh, when I wrote No Straight Lines in 2000, and, well, published in 2011, that was a seven year project. And that's kind of when you and I first bumped into each other uh, along that road. Um, I was thinking very much about my disillusionment, I suppose, in terms of how I saw where business is going or what, where business was taking us um, and try to explore those ideas. And there's no doubt that um, this last book, Do Build, is very much an exposition and a focus um, on Tom in terms of what I think needs to be done. Um, I think it's uh, an important topic uh, and I think it's a necessary one. And in the last five years that we've all gone through, and then particularly the last, you know, 12 to 14 months, uh, I think asking that question, what does the world need? Um, and I agree with you that business is the engine, it's the agency, um, it's the ability to bring that transformation into the world. That's where I felt I had to bring all what I knew, what I believed and what I felt as a kind of philosophy, as a framework, um, but hopefully a playbook, a, a sense of questioning mm. in terms of then, uh, if not this, what else can it be like? Um, and I think shaped in a sense of, we can take an optimistic view of the world. It's not happy clappy, but it is that definitely saying to people, you can be on this journey and you can play an important role in this. So let's get this straight for the audience. You are a capitalist. I believe that making money is important. Uh, all businesses cannot operate without the oxygen of money. We know that. But it's a question then about the calibration of why you're in business. Um, what is your uh, mission or your purpose? Um, how are you set up? What are your values? Um, and uh, as you know, in, in the book, I talk about the need to move from this idea of an extractive economy to one that is premised on the idea of regeneration. Perfect. No, no, I, 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 I agree. And I, sh I share that view completely. Um, we'll come on to the subject of things like B corporations and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I, I have recently got into some incredibly annoyed rows with friends, not just with outsiders over this kind of motherhood and apple pie approach to um, things that it was called corporate social responsibility and now it's ESG mm. and you get all of this crap talked by do-gooders who want to have companies, you know, behave well. And I'm actually ruthless in it. I, I say, I am a capitalist, right? But I say, how come we are so wet as a group that we allow the poisoning of the commons, you know, people putting stuff in the water, uh, poisoning the soil, poisoning the air. And we don't actually stand up and scream and shout and say, it is not your right. And one of the things that I don't think we would disagree on, but I'm just going to throw this little pebble in the pool for you to chew on, 
uh, if that isn't a wonderful mix, <laughs> um, is that there was one of my great heroes is a guy who died five, six years ago called Stephen Lloyd, who was the senior partner at Bateswell's Braithwaite, Braithwaite, which is Britain's leading charity uh, 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 legal firm. And he and I uh, were, before his very sad and untimely death, we're working up a position which is what is so ridiculous about the following proposition? Why, if you are given by us, the people, the right to have a company limited in its liabilities, why then should you not, as a price of that ability, mm. give the state, in the form of us, but it's given to the state, a golden share, which means that every audit has to take account of the public wealth, the common wealth that is being impacted by that company. And you know what? The amount of auditors that get angry with me because they have no bloody excuse. And mm. they tempt us by saying, oh, we'll have voluntary codes of practice. And I'm looking at, you know, carbon levels. What is it today? 420, you know, whatever. And I'm thinking everybody's worrying about what to do. And there is a mechanism right there, right there. If, if, if people in good heart said, we're capitalists, but you're not allowed to have be a capitalist and actually take the Commonwealth without paying for it. We could do an awful lot. Mm. Could you talk about law enforcement in the 21st century and how it sits in the do build uh, framework? Well, I think that um, <clears throat> your your point, I think, sort of alludes to a bit in the book where I reference um, Iris Murdoch, who um, yeah. wrote uh, The Sovereignty of the Good. Um, she was a writer, novelist, uh, philosopher, as, as you know. Um, and there's a great bit in the book where she says the good or the bringing of the good, which is a universal value, which I think beauty is equally uh, a universal value in, its, in all its complexity um, or its multifaceted expansiveness of what it can do for us. Is, is part of that framework that Iris was talking about. And she says, the good um, or the bringing of the good should not be the name of an esoteric object, but should be the tool of every rational man. And in my, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 56, right? So I've been in business since I was what, uh, I left college in a, when I was 21. Uh, you can do the maths, um, is, I could never compute, and it was partly because of maybe my entry into business as a, as a craftsman and working in that practice where I felt, and I was given the sense of my work was in service to others and to the greater good. Um, and there are all sorts of things in that that we could explore that we talked about earlier today around the principles of craftsmanship, right? But I could never understand why it would be that you as a business would do harm to others, either commercially through your extractive processes of your business model, you would do harm to the people that would work for you, why would you do that? Or you would do harm to the planet that mm. supports us. Mm. I really could never reconcile myself to that. Um, and uh, what I do think in terms of, you know, we talk about law, I think that specifically, I believe within the next five years, and then it will just increase at greater speed, those businesses that do not have a, a climate take back agenda, a climate positive agenda, those that are seen to be willingly harming those that around them will be legislated against. Because the reality is, is that in the end, we as a species only thrive and survive if we work, as you call it, as the commons. And as you know, when the internet you know, took off, particularly uh, many, many years ago, and I was witness to that, as were you, you know, we are uh, pre-digital <laughs> and post-digital. Um, there was a great, great conversations about the commons and, and what it means. And the reality is we know that if we take too much from uh, the commons, that doesn't serve all, then we are, are in peril. Um, and that to me is absolute common sense. The real problem is, is that, you know, within business schools, within MBAs and uh, all of that, 
um, what you're taught is the only thing you should be focused on is growth at all and any cost. And I wrote this book in a sense, in terms of them really getting to the heart of it, is that I wanted to show that we can be in this world, we can thrive in this world, we can be in business in this world doing amazing things, but we don't have to do it at the cost of all that you know we touch and all that we are uh, engaged engage with. Um, I'm not articulated that particularly well, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say there, Tim. No, I do. I do. So I'm going to throw down another gauntlet. Are you basically saying that you and me, wishy-washy liberals, are actually responsible for the destruction of the world because we're not strong enough, not muscular enough to demand legislation mm. because the act of legislation feels anathema to us in terms of the way we feel about liberty? Um, I wouldn't see it like that um, at all, uh, if I'm honest, I think that, um, as you know, uh, ultimately what we would be talking about in terms of the context of business is about power and yeah. those that have power are those that want to keep power. And, you know, the, to roll out that old Shakespearean, you know, chestnut, but, you know, power corrupts and ultimate power corrupts absolutely. And, uh, and I think that we, we see that. Um, I've always argued that those that are in power never give it up. You're not going to see Mark Zuckerberg giving it up willingly, I can tell you, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, nor will the fossil fuel companies or whatever, even though it's the right thing to do. So I don't see it as wishy-washy liberals. And actually, what I think is important is, is to give a very different sen sense of articulation of the framing that... Uh, there is a way in which we can be in the world um, where we can help all that will thrive. And um, as I said uh, at, at the beginning of this, um, what the last five years has shown us, I mean, well, let's go back to writing those straight lines in 2011. And what I said was then, the, just the pricey of that is we are at the adaptive edge of our industrial society and we face a design challenge. And what is going to come next is going to be immensely uh, non-linear uh, in, in what we're going to face. I think what broke my heart was actually watching all of those businesses um, and politicians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, doubling down almost on the very things that brought the GFC or the global financial crisis into reality. But now we've had a pandemic and that's an abyss. And what I hope is, is that people now have had a chance to have a look down about how far, how black and how awful that could be if we continue on that basis. But there's no point talking about the doomster and the gloomster aspects of this thing. People are driven, I think, on belief um, uh, as much about, as, as well as sort of thinking about it from a sort of a knowledge-based perspective. And what we have to do is we've got to tell a compelling story about how this could be so much better. So I don't see it as wishy-washy liberalism. I think it's about a better story that we have to tell that can take everybody down that road together. I, I think I agree with you. I must admit, with every passing year, maybe it's the age I am, I have learned to despise um, the majority of middle-aged men to a point of loathing. Um, and I would include myself at the age when I was middle-aged, to the point that that kind of uh, ability to imagine the world is linear when any more than rudimentary study of how we've got to here is a, the history, the narrative of shocks, just completely defeats me, how we actually have a ruling class who do not see that we need to act in a particular way. I was talking... The other day, I think I was telling you, I was talking to the, uh, some senior people at DEFRA, you know, the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, and they were really, really pleased talking to me about regenerative agriculture and organicism and things, knowing that I'd love all that stuff. And I said, look, I love all that stuff. I pleased them. I said, I really, really like regenerative agriculture and I love mob grazing and I know exactly where you're going with all of this. And are you, have you actually thought that maybe your smug self-satisfaction at loving the things that I love is going to lead your country into an absolute cul-de-sac? What do you know about Celtech? And they looked at me as if I had kicked a baby. Honestly, 
Right. I said, you are so far off the pace with your delight in, in regenerative agriculture that you haven't spotted that in America, the fastest growing companies per, per, per by value are clean meat companies. You haven't spotted that the people entering that market now in a billion dollar way are the Chinese. Why? Because their land, their good land has all been built on and they cannot afford to have a hunger for livestock, real livestock. They've got to actually tell a new story about this isn't livestock, but it tastes like meat. And they're going to put millions and millions and millions into it. You're going to see the food lots of Central and South America and the middle of the USA as complete wastelands in five to 10 years time. There's a, an utter revolution coming our way. And the danger for me is that those of us who have the values that we have get so satisfied by a narrative that pleases us you don't see another one coming along. When people talk about the light at the end of the tunnel, be careful, old son, it's not a train. Um, I actually think Britain as a country, I'll be jingoistic for just one second, it'll be the last time I do it, that this country is in very real and present danger of getting smug about the fact that it thinks it's embracing a green revolution and it has no idea what the word revolution actually will represent. Hmm. And that's why I think your book is really, really important because the best... Um, uh, the best hope we have is that we create a leadership cadre of people who are always looking out for what is in, if I was to say the phrase, the national interest, by that I mean, I don't mean it in a jingoistic way. I mean, in terms of looking after all, all the citizenry, um, there's got to be a kind of scouting mechanism to see what's coming. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, well... Um... In terms of picking up on the idea of leadership, obviously it's something that I talk about in the in the book. And um, actually, we, if we go back to well, again, eleven years ago, um, one of the things I talked about as a principle in terms of how we dealt with the world was dealing with the concept of ambiguity. Um, I came across a great piece of graffiti once that said that what, what happens in vagueness stays in vagueness, um, which I always really <laughs> liked. And, um, and, 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 but the serious point behind that was about what I would call pattern recognition. Um, I'm profoundly dyslexic, uh, as you may or may not know, but uh, the gift of dyslexia is, is that you join dots that other people don't see. And we also talked uh, um, at great length uh, earlier this morning about that idea about being aware and having awareness, you know, what is in front of you, what is behind you, what is, um, you know, what is it that you can't see, but maybe you could see, how do you build that pattern recognition? And that to me is something that is absolutely key and important. Mm -hmm. And um, the people that, uh, you know, I've looked at and studied and, and thought about as, as part of the sort of, you know, the, the, the curation of the appendix of the book, they all seem to me people which are incredibly aware of the current circumstances that we are in. I agree with you. I mean, one of the things I suppose that, that, that um, dismayed me the most when I was very much in the driving seat working with lots of businesses in terms of driving innovation projects uh, for them in a whole variety of, of, of ways was their myopia and their hubris. And um, I won't name names, but what I can tell you is, is hubris is gravitational. It's not bottom up. Um, hubris starts at the top of the mountain and it just trickles down. So when you meet someone on reception of a business and they treat you with great disrespect, um, what that means is that the company is already in trouble because it's not seeing what's coming next. Um, I mean, in terms of your comment about government, as we know, they're probably normally at least five years behind the curveball. Um, and um, unfortunately, they equally are really dealing with, or what we've seen currently, is not dealing with the world practically as they should do but it seems to me driven by ideology at the moment and that's a huge problem i have no problem with philosophy and the framing of philosophy because in that it gives a scope to think reflect um calculate have dialogue which are all the things that leaders should be doing and businesses should be doing 
but not making those decisions through an ideology which is fixed um, in time uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, and that, to me, I think is is a, a very important part of what I'm doing. And and in in a way, part of the way that I've written the book is actually is not to be prescriptive per se, but also to give that that place where I ask questions. Because what I do say is, I don't know where you're going to get to. I don't quite know all of what we need to make. I have a feeling and a point of view on that. But maybe these sets of questions, like, does it matter? Uh, does it matter to the world? Does it matter to me? Does it matter to my team, uh, et cetera, are things then that get us to think much more deeply about how we're going to use the resources, our social capital, mm -hmm. our economic capital, you know, the treasure um, that we have and we hold um, to be deployed in its greatest uh, capacity and capability. That's a really interesting thing. If I may, could I digress with a, a, a tiny story? Which mm. I would, uh, uh, some great questions come up. Look, guys, could you stop putting those really good questions up there because you're actually making me feel a bit second rate. So keep them till <laughs> later. Um, I just want to tell you, I had the best um, elevator pitch ever. I, uh, about four years ago, I got into a lift in London um, and this guy put his hands into the lift doors as they were closing and wrenched the door open. He said, I've really got to make an elevator pitch. I've promised myself I build up baby. And I said, well, you better be. I, I said, I said, I, 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 I stop it. And I said, I, my dear fellow, I said, I said, you better make it quick because we're on the fourth floor. Uh, and he said, um, um, I will. It's very quick. A friend of mine has just inherited a rainforest and he doesn't know what to do with it. Will you help? And I said, you have my attention. Anyway, this story is sensational. This guy uh, was a friend of a chap who just inherited this rainforest with his two brothers uh, because their father, who was an eccentric, uh, an eccentric, very wealthy chap, had gone to Costa Rica and he'd seen this terrible degraded farmland. Mm -hmm. And he'd bought 42 farms in total, about 10,000 acres. And he put a fence around it and hired some staff to make sure that it was so. And he said, don't do anything. Let the birds shit it back to life. Anyway, I flew out there to have a look about two years ago, and the story made me, you know, quite misty eyed because you and I, we spend our lives trying to write stories, okay, and, 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 and narratives, and we hone them and whatever. And I had, in the course of two days, the most extraordinary experience because the brothers had all flown out together because they were going to give water rights to the village of Paquera, which is the near, nearest village town, 8,000 people. And the mayor of that town made the best speech on environment I have ever heard in my life. He got up and he said, before this man arrived here, we were doomed. There were murders every year because we had drought for six months of that year. Since the rainforest has come back, because in the 30 years since he bought it, there's now this huge secondary rainforest. There are four rivers running 365 days a year out of this river. And every morning when you look up at the mountains, you see weather systems developing. And to be in a town which had been in such terrible disarray, and now they had a fire service, all this stuff, the huge volunteer, volunteer, because they all suddenly realized, and the mayor's speech was all about we are some of the very few people on earth who get a second chance to realize the mistakes we have made and have another go at it. Yeah. And it was just, I mean, you know, the hair stood up on the back of my neck, but in a way we need that sort of story, Alan, for, for the Western world, because actually when you see it in such an extreme, you cannot deny that the rainforest returning created the rivers, which created the life, which fed the livestock, which did the, you know what I mean? It's got a complete circular, thing to it and uh, so the reason I'm, i've gone in this long waffle is because you very powerfully talk in the book about uh, the circular economy um and you make a, a very clear comparison between modern business standards which are kind of exploitative extractive uh, and those which are done uh, are, are perhaps let's call them synergistic regenerative and so on um so if, if we were to use, say, that Costa Rican example as being mm. an, uh, something you cannot deny, and it's got an almost spiritual power to, or redemptive power to the story. Um, when I look at our country, 
I'm sorry, to, and someone just said, are you jingoistic or nationalistic? No, it's just because we're in Britain. I'm talking about Britain. Uh, I could talk about anywhere, but what, where would you start with this story of common sense, which you talk a lot about, and business being a salvation mm. in terms of the moral compass that you think is necessary to create the right generative, regenerative forces? Sorry, that was a very wordy question. Do you, are, you, are you with it? No, I'm, I'm, I'm on that. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, uh, again, I mean, I think circling back to the beginning of our conversation, but, uh, you know, for, I would say beauty is our homecoming. And um, I say that because uh, I was thinking about it today, but knowing that we were going to just speaking today as I went for my, my daily walk, as I do uh, a couple of hours in the fence, um, is that we use the word beauty as a, uh, you know, a definition of many things. Um, you know, that was a beautiful experience, a beautiful uh, piece of music, uh, a beautiful food. Um, you know, we could go on and on and on. And, or, and we under, so I want to say beauty is our homecoming. Um, it, it's the thing that absolutely we're connected to. And that kind of leads me on to um, this reconnection with nature. I mean, in many ways, um, I mean, I can tell you a story. Many years ago, I picked a, uh, a client up um, from Cambridge Station and drove him out to my house, which is uh, out in the fence um, even then. And he looked out the window and he said, I can't remember the last time I saw a field. And I, can, I kind of scratched my head a little bit around that. And, uh, you know, uh, but, um, but of course, you know, it, we, we have, in a sense, um, I think, fallen out of nature. And what I think we need to do is we need to fall back in love with it in the sense of not saying it's pretty, but understanding that we are absolutely a fundamental part of it. And we've talked about this before. And if there are people on the call that know me, but I've you know, read last year Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And if you've not read that book, I highly recommend it because she has a way of reconnecting uh, us to what it means to be part of the natural world. And it's the language that she so eloquent, eloquently, and she's not the only one, but I use this as a primary example of talking about the idea that, you know, nature doesn't take all from something else, that it's always in a highly operating place of um, sharing knowledge, information, resources. You know, we talk about, you know, how trees uh, or forests work in terms and the mycelium that sits under, you know, huge, vast distances, um, sharing resources, um, which uh, show us that actually it's, it's, we only thrive and survive if we work in a highly cooperative way. The problem is, is as you know, the, the uh, story of our economic uh, world has been being a good consumer, and it's all about I, it's not about we. Um, and um, yet, we know, we also know, that said, that said, if we look at what's happened in the pandemic, for example, extraordinary abilities or cap people operating at a level of compassion, empathy, uh, collective will that they all know that the only way that this works is if we cooperate and collaborate together um, and so uh, I suppose part of what I say also in the book is that we all have agency we all have the ability to actually contribute and to make that kind of happen and I think that there is uh, an intense will um, not by everybody, but I think there is an extraordinary community around the world um, where is that desire to maybe refine that that epiphany of the uh, the forest that you know the, uh, the that you discovered um, that spoke so eloquently to it. We just have to, in a way, find the language that we can do it where we can bring people over to a different way of looking um, because we can't show them the regeneration of um, a, a piece of land, um, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away. And as you know, Tim, I mean, the reality is, is seeing is believing, right? I mean, it's a cliche, but as you know, in all cliches, there's a, there's a, there's a truth. Yeah. Um, and that to me is extremely uh, important. Um, 
to show that um, and to show that we all have a role. And in a sense, it's why, as I said, in the, in the book with the appendix, I've taken a country, uh, which is New Zealand, uh, which is looking at its long-term future around well-being as a strategy. Um, I shouldn't use that word. I don't like that word really, but you know, what are we going to do moving forward? right down to a one man ceramicist who's making beautiful objects because, you know, we talked about, um, uh, you know, uh, Suetsu Yanagi this morning, um, you know, the very famous Japanese uh, ceramicist and potter who uh, his book, you know, The Beauty in Everyday Things. And, and they work on that scale. Um, and I think being able to tell that story is, is very important uh, to me. Sorry, long answer, but... Um... No, crikey. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And it's been really interesting seeing um, the, the, the conversation at the bottom of the screen. Someone was talking about another very good book on the subject, Sand Talk. Um, if I was allowed to recommend any other book on this show other than yours, it would be, <laughs> it would be uh, Dark Emu, which is actually the best book I've read over the last three, four years. And I read a lot of books. Um, I'm very rarely shocked, but Dark Emu is the story of the Australians uh, as discovered by the very, very first, um, um, by the very first explorers in Australia, who were then silenced by the colonial office who said, we do not want the story of these people that we want to be ignorant and have no uh, civilization. Uh, their agenda was they didn't want anybody to have any claim to land but the truth of the story of the original or what is now called the traditional ownership groups of australia is utterly stunning i mean stunning they had towns of up to seven thousand people they had grain stores that were burgeoning they had fish traps that fed whole communities um van diemen land which is now a desert was an absolute prairie of grain because these guys had discovered techniques for making plates of clay thin plates of clay which they buried in the sand to capture the dew at night and then to create these amazing crops um and you're, you're reminded of this splendid irony which you get of course with robin wakimura's book um as well that maybe once humans have stopped being so darned arrogant about what they think their civilization is worth and ask themselves what they would need to, do, to know in order to keep their civilization like that, you'll suddenly find that an awful lot of the solutions we're going to be looking at over the next 10 years of academia are going to be uh, thoughts that uh, indigenous people have had for an awful long time. But because we translated them in an infantile way, we've been patronizing about it. I know that there's at least one wizard on this call um, watching the show uh, uh, t tonight, my friend uh, Robin Hambry Tennyson, who could talk, you know, to the end of time about the tremendous wealth of the world that we're missing because of our mm. our arrogance. Mm. So bring us back now to the circular economy, which, as a, um, it, it, it's obviously something that everybody on this call will be aware of as a concept. We know um, that it is championed um uh, uh, by by ellen MacArthur foundation and whatever we know also it's the sort of thing that lots of people who live in cities talk about at coffee at coffee and at dinner parties and they know sweet fanny adam about so let's hit it let's talk about the circular economy the reality of the circular economy and what it might mean and how close are we to it well um good let me just before we, we go there, I just wanted to just reference John Ruskin. And, <sighs> um, you know, in the book, I talk about that he says that we need to do more than satisfy our own desires and that what we should really be focusing on is what sustains us for an eternity. And if you think about how long ago that he was alive and, and that his work, um, uh, you know, his work on that... Um, then he's still resonating with us today. And I think, and then if I, if I repeat myself, I apologize, but I think that in that statement, we need to focus on what will sustain us for an eternity. What if we were to view what we create as businesses in this world as gifts bestowed upon the world? Mm. What world are you trying to make, build and create? It doesn't matter then whether, you know, you're a 
you know, a vineyard or a bank or an energy company, a farm, you know, a sneaker brand, a trainer brand, you know, what are you doing to allow that to happen? And I think that from that, I think what I said uh, again, um, uh, and if I said it before, I apologize, but, you know, nature has run the longest R&D project that we know, you know, um, she's the best designer that we've got. Um, and her purpose is to support the needs of all life. Um, to your point about the circular economy, she doesn't waste a single atom, not one. Everything is repurposed. Um, and I think that also that she works with a very long horizon line. Um, this fallacy that we think in five, even to 10 years is a long framework is, is ridiculous to me. Um, and I think that we therefore need to think about that in terms of, um, as Gabriel Brambi said, he was the founder of Grand Force Brook, um, a, a, a company that makes axes. Um, and I used that for all sorts of reasons when I wrote the, the last book, but beauty in form, beauty in process, beauty as ecosystem, beauty in regeneration, right? So um, he talked about the total, what we take, what we make, and what we waste. And the reality is, is that, you know, the industrial kind of speed bump that we've been through for the last 150 years is actually, although we think we're very good at it and, you know, it's highly efficient, is just massively wrong in terms of its design principles. Um, and... Um, what I can see is from the work that I've done, again, is there are an extraordinary amount of people around the world, uh, either as individuals or actually in as quite large organizations and corporations, which are actually demonstrating that they can be so much more effective and efficient and resilient. Uh, you know, nature is incredibly resilient, no matter what we've been doing to it at the moment, um, where the principle is circular, the principle is regenerative. Um, and that is the design model that I think that we need to be uh, working towards um, with great speed and energy right now. Um, I think of, uh, there's one particular company in the book that I talk about, Climeworks. Um, yeah. Their work is about the, uh, you know, uh, so that's quite interesting because, um, you know, we need to extract uh, I think they say something like 10 billion tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere. So it's not about stopping what we're doing. We actually got to, you know, is what is called climate take back, which interface also, you know, talk about. Um, and what I think is, is that um, what they're demonstrating is an extraordinary level of innovation, an extraordinary level of, you know, the mattering as we talked about, they can create new business uh, you know, models uh, out of that, but all based on the principle of circular and regeneration. Um, with the idea also that everyone can contribute um, to what it is that they're doing. That's really interesting. I, I always think of my purpose, if that doesn't sound vain, as being to throw pebbles in ponds and um, I spoke last year at John Elkington's 70th birthday, and I, I said to the audience who were most of the great and the good of the environment movement, which, as you can imagine, must usually makes for an incredibly dull lunch. <laughs> um, uh, and, and anyway, we were sitting there, and I was saying, um, I, I thought I'd start the conversation uh, uh, for his birthday speech by saying, uh, who in this room gives a five or a tenner um, a week or a month to those really great charities like Water Aid and things like that, Action Aid. Um, and lots of people put their, 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 their hands up. And I said, and who here actually thinks that Water Aid is going to provide um, clean drinking water for the world's population in a time scale that is important? And no one put their hands up. And I said, do you not think that the problem is we have arrived at a Rubicon that we need to cross, which is our old fashioned politics, which are left and right, anti-capital, pro-capital or whatever. And the truth is, if we, if we were to say that in 10 years, we wanted all people to have access to clean drinking water, 
the companies you'd actually need to engage to do it with that expertise have got horrible names like Exxon, Aramco, BP, Shell, you know, all, all of those sort of things, because they have the skill for project management and drilling. And I'm fascinated about how we can develop a social contract which is based on understanding uh, wealth in the sense of uh, intellectual assets, skills and talents, ends which are long term social ends and how we can redirect the way society then engages with those things that were perceived as enemies. Um, anyway, it, it was a very good discussion afterwards about this, this very subject, which is, do you really want to solve this problem? Or do you want the joy of being cross on the sidelines? Yeah. I think there's an awful lot of bloody people out there who've got no concept of solving the problems. They just want to point out the problems. I mean, my mate John Sovan at Greenpeace, he says, our narrative arc, and you talk about it beautifully in this book, by the way. He says, our narrative arc is the problem Greenpeace was set up to describe itself in terms of what it was against. The real battleground is how can we now talk about sunny uplands and where we want to be, what we're for. Um, so... Can we get round to you and storytelling? Are you about to pour a glass of wine? So I'm about to catch you by. No, I'm no. just I'm just catching. There's just I'm picking up on something that you've written. Uh, you you've just said. So I wanted oh, to. Okay, no, no, just, sorry. sorry. I, I didn't want to actually catch you with a sort of a, a hospital <laughs> pass there. No, um, <laughs> but but my direct question to you is: If you were advising our mates who are on this call, fellow travellers about how do we leave the baggage of our politics, all of our baggage outside and re-look at the world. Um, what's that, we were jo joking about, you talked about graffiti just now, there's some other great graffiti just as you go over the Severn Bridge uh, into Wales on one of those buildings there, which says some open minds should be closed for repair. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think, um, I'd love your view. I'd love your view on this about openness. Uh, 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 about do you actually want a solution or do you want to politically grandstand? No, I want a solution. I want to get on with it. You, you and I have been talking about that anyway. Um, uh, you know, and and to me, I suppose the, the uh, I mean, the writing for me um, came from just an absolute desperation and frustration of. If I can explain it better uh, to people, um, they might see that there is an alternative way of, of looking at the world. And as when we started off on the call, it's just taken a, a little while to um, get that storytelling mm. right, I, I think, in many ways. Um, what Jan Wurzbacher said to me, who was one of the co-founders of um, Climeworks, is that um, he said, what I increasingly see, which is why I was reaching for a piece of paper, um, is asking how we can, uh, is, what I increasingly see is people asking how we can contribute in a way the task seems insurmountable as an I, but as a we. And as you know, Muhammad Ali's famous poem, uh, when Parkey asked him what his shortest poem was, poem was, was me, we. Um, or as Carl Jung said, I need we to truly be I. So what is the most powerful tr tool to trigger action? Um, it is through people, it is through everyone. If every employer would ask their employer to become sustainable, or I would prefer the word regenerative, if every voter asked their government to become more sustainable, even regenerative, then ultimately they have to do it. And that to me is all about agency. Um, that is all about uh, making that happen. And, 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 and that's the truth of it. Um, people that are protesting in Myanmar at the moment, the people that were protesting in Belarus, um, you know, last year, uh, really fronting up to power. And as you know, they, well, it, it, it won't go away. I mean, it's always there. But to me, the agency part is absolutely imperative. And as I say, it's why I chose... Uh, the idea of, you know, um, how to build a business that the world needs, um, because we agree, um, and I hope other people on this call agree, that it is, you have access to capital, you have access to agency, you don't have to ask anyone's permission, you can choose that moral compass, you can decide how to lead, you can bring those things into the world, and if it needs to scale, 
and, um, and it feels right to do so, then you can bring something into the world that will be transformational. What you have to understand, therefore, is also to me is, is you are part of a movement and you are part of an ecosystem. Um, there's a lady called Jean Van Arkel. I hope she's on the call. We became very good friends. She was head of sustainable development at Interface. And Jean and I talked uh, a number of years ago when I interviewed her. Um, and um, she said, what I already see is um, there is an ecosystem. Um, it's maybe a little fractured at the moment. Um, it doesn't quite know. Uh, it, everybody is doing the same thing. So um, maybe the guys at Climeworks uh, don't aren't you know friends with the guys at Veya, you know the sneaker brand, for example, yep. um, or uh, you know my good friend Conrad Brits, who runs Falcon Coffees, who says what we need to do is we need to restore you know the rights of all the people that are growing you know the coffee in this world um, so that they can have better lives, right? Um, there are a whole bunch of people out there doing extraordinary things. And you, Tim, are absolutely one of those people in my mind also in um, being prepared to be unreasonable. And one of the things I think I talk about in the book in terms of that leadership thing is A, to be lovingly disruptive and B, to be bloody unreasonable whilst you're doing it. Um, and that to me is really important um, and that you don't listen to the orthodoxy um, that is being shaped by the news agenda, but we are out there and we are, uh, I think, willing. Some of us will become storytellers. Um, I can't design the machines that, um, you know, Jan and his um, friend Christoph have designed at Climeworks. Um, I'm not the guys at Veja. Um, I'm not, uh, you know, um, any one of the other incredible, you know, people that have set up these businesses to bring transformational change into the world. Um, I think I've got a role to play um, and I hope I can play that role. But collectively, we bring that together. We can prove to people that there is something so much better that we can have and we can harness. That's what I think. I think you're absolutely right. And I suspect very soon um, we're going to have our heads cut off if we don't open ourselves up to a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what a, a wonderful interview you, you, you've given us all. I, 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 it's actually one of those frustrating ones, um, which is, is you actually wish it was longer, but you know that people's asses couldn't put up with it. You know, you actually, it, needs to be, it needs to be in series, you know. Um, um, so I, I know that was rather a, a crude thing to say, but what, what, having read um, some of the questions coming through, it suggests... Um, it suggests a number of things, you know. It suggests, number one, what can we do, all of us collectively, to create a sense of nobility in terms of the way we look at public service? Mm -hmm. What can we do to actually make people who work for the various departments in government, whatever, not feel as if life is just a question of ducking people, throwing things at you because you can never deliver to we the people what we expect or want or yeah. unreasonably desire and also i mean if education is so important which i know we both feel it is because we're hoping to embark on an adventure together in that area and it is today i just thought i'd, I'd just share with you everybody it's um uh, ken robinson the late ken robinson who was on our board it was his birthday today and there's been the, 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 the his imagine imagine if festival today uh, um there is something about teachers also, isn't there? There's something, but if we think the most valuable people, let, let me put it this way. If we think our children are the most valuable things in our lives, if we've got children, or for, forgive me if you haven't got children, but I'm, I'm making a, a point. And we entrust them to teachers. Surely we must think that they are really, really valuable. So what can we do to massively improve the the clumsy phrase so forgive me the brand of teaching and the collective conversation about what a great uh, form of education might look like because surely until that moment we haven't really got a, a roadmap to a sunny upland have we not well in the in the longer term no and and well yes so you know you and i have been talking um I think we need a school of beautiful business. Um, we need to be teaching beauty um, in its um, most uh, elemental and rudimentary forms right from the get-go. As we know, uh, our education system is immensely binary. 
um, linked to an old way of thinking about how we educate. I mean, all of my children are, have been profoundly dyslexic and uh, to watch them damaged um, at times going through the education system has broken my heart. All I wish is um, I'd invested in, you know, uh, the best jazz drummer I could have ever found because I think my son, uh, the youngest one, um, would have actually just found a very different way into the world. And of course, you know, it, I feel immensely guilty about it because I, I expended a huge amounts of financial resource um, putting my son into a system that was just going to damage him, um, which is, 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 the re, is the reality in, mm-hmm. in many respects. And I think that um, it's always perplexed me, Tim, because partly because of my own journey, and I suppose I've been fortunate in, in maybe how I, you know, people I've met on the way or kind of what happened and, you know, whatever. But uh, if you were to invest in, the full potential of any human being that comes onto this planet, whatever that may be, whether that person's going to be a guitar player, a physicist, uh, a ceramicist, uh, you know, a politician, whatever, you know, and you really kind of imbue them with that sense of um, generosity. So in the book, we talk about, I talk about the generosity of leadership. Um, And you understand that compassion, empathy, non-judgment, um, curiosity. Um, these are all qualities that allow you to uh, explore yourself and how to be in the world as the best that you can be. Um, surely every country would just thrive on that basis. The people then were just p- performing at their best. And as you know, if you perform at your best, you deliver so much more as a, as a consequence of that. Mm. Um, mm. And so, absolutely, I, I, I think that we really need to have a very different type of conversation uh, about um, education and how people are educated. And what I do know is, is there are some people that have read the previous book, Do Design, uh, where they feel as teachers that that could be taken into schools um, mm. and turned into a way of maybe helping uh, you know, young children think about themselves and themselves and the world towards each other and the world that surrounds them that would energize them and give them a whole set of different kind of maybe capacities and capabilities um, to be the best they can in the world. Anyway, I'll stop there. Um, Brilliant, Alan. I I think, I think, um, I think I I see young Matthew Shaw uh, looking (laughs) learned. (laughs) He's looking suitably dissipated to be learned. Um, Matthew, I, I think we should stop. It's been, I, I, I've actually been having a great time listening both to Alan and some of the smartest questions I've ever seen passing on, underneath here. Um, uh, um, so, so I've actually just touched something and they came up. Um, so shall we shut up for a moment and, and, and let Alan take the brunt of some of these other really smart people in the audience tonight? Yeah, I'm going to read them out on behalf of people because we've got so many people here, and uh, and then and then you can respond if you're happy to. Sure. Yeah, and it's going to be short. Remember, remember, General Sherman at Atlanta. Thank you, sir. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I'll try and be concise. Ah. Okay, we've got lots of questions. So I'll start and let's see how far we can get with the time. Um, so we're going to start with your gear, uh, and the question is: Considering myself a liberal. I keep wondering whether the root cause of the environmental degradation is people's value base rather than their political stance. What do we need to shift in order to improve inside out rather than outside in, assuming that we can only change ourselves and not others? Oh, what a delightful question, isn't it? Yes, indeed. This was supposed to be a short answer. You could write a bloody novel on that one. (laughs) You could, you could. I I mean, I think very simply, um, we have to see ourselves as um, all as the same species and all of the same race. And in a way that's the, you you did depoliticize that. My friend Tashi Mannix, the Tibetan calligrapher says, everybody wants to be happy and everybody wants to be free, but how to be happy and how to be free is the biggest challenge that we face. Um, 
And so I think that that reconnection to, again, as I, we talked about the, the natural world and understanding that is absolutely is sort of integral to that. Um, don't judge people. Everyone that is in this world uh, is reacting through a whole set of different stimuli. Um, and that's where the acts of compassion and empathy are so important to be able to understand maybe where that person's coming from, even if you don't agree with them. And that's a big step in the right direction, I think. Gosh, I'd love to have been able to answer like that, Alan. I'm going to come completely from the opposite field. The law, bring down the full weight of the law and recognise how terrible us human beings are. Let us take a, a leaf from Lee Kuan Yew's book of Singapore, a country I couldn't possibly live in but admire for the standards they've enforced. Hmm. Um, I say that simply because it's bloody outrageous what we, uh, we put up with other people doing in our society and to think that actually people can get away with their fly tipping, their rudeness, their racism, their complete disregard for the, 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 the commons in any shape, manner or form. And that brings us back to the first, sorry, this is a bit of a rant, but we talk about, uh, you talk about Mark Zuckerberg, crikey. Um, uh, do we remember the enclosures, eh, everybody on this call? Uh, do we not see going on right now the enclosure of the commons? Mm. And we still allow ourselves to believe in Google and Zuckerberg because they're young, because they're hip, because they've got marketing. These are really dangerous organisations and people, especially so because the people that run them don't see that they're in the wrong at all. If you want to be really excited and terrified at the same time, read my hero, Jaron Lanier's book, Who Owns the Future? Jaron and uh, Tim Berners-Lee are regarded by those in the game as being pretty much the founders um, of the World Wide Web. And Lanier and uh, uh, Berners-Lee fell out because Lanier thought that Berners-Lee was weak in allowing it to open up before they had found a copyright mechanism to trace where the knowledge and what was put on the web took place. Hmm. So effectively it opened up. So now copyright is stolen from people all over the world. Look at Google, look at Google Translate and ask yourself a question. How is it possible that a company is now worth billions that actually has made its billions through theft? It has made its translate mechanism by taking translations from one book to the other and running them through an algorithm of millions of books in translation to become ever more accurate. None of those translators were paid for a penny of their lives and yet we think it's in a global good and private people get paid. Uh, and I'm a capitalist so I just thought I'd say that. Thank you. I, I love this. We can come at all of these problems from different uh, ends of the spectrum and still find some middle grounds in which what, we can all do something. Uh, and this one is another one of those questions. I love this question. This is from Hilary Gallo. The obsession with money seems to be a lot of the problem. Does beauty need its own currency or does it have it already? Well, I think, it's a, I think it has it already, to be honest with you. Um, you know, again, if, uh, well, referencing back to that idea about reciprocity, um and the idea of generosity mm. um uh how we should treat each other i think i say in the book it's it, uh, you know if you if you're if you're running a business where you're you know you're you know back <laughs> tacking on the uh, tim's uh track in the in the wind there um uh, if you're doing something where you're harming people if you're doing something where you're extracting and you're causing damage um, and if you think that's good business, then you're not, you're not, you're not in business. You're not doing the right things. It's very simple in, in that sense. And I think that, um, just to add to that, when I was actually talking to Alison Brooks, who, um, is an architect who runs mm -hmm. Alison Brooks Architects, uh, someone I've got to know, um, a little bit over the last few years. And we talked about beauty and architecture and she said, you know, we're not allowed to talk about beauty and architecture partly because of the influence of the modernist movement. Um, and I think that's sort of connected to the whole idea about rationalism. But come to my city of Cambridge, there's a lot of people who like to stand in front of those incredible buildings um, uh, because they're described to be beautiful, um, as there are in other all sorts of places around the world. We understand the language. We understand the principles. 
And I think it's actually our right to fight for beauty to be back on the table as a language that we speak and we understand. And it's not seen as being weak, wishy-washy, liberal, whatever. Because I can tell you that running my life as a human being, if I'm working it on the basis of also being compassionate, uh, non-judgmental and empathetic and being open-minded and not to lose my temper in anger under any provocation requires so much more of my humanity and my capacity as a human being than any other way. We know the lingua franca. We know the value of it. We just need to reclaim it. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's change a little bit here then in terms of the type of question. Here's one from uh, Thea Scans. If changing mindsets is the catalyst for change and stories are the means, mm. which settings and platforms may philosophers, writers, myth tellers, anthropologists and artists engage with or on in order to do impactful work? And who are the forerunners? Who, in your experience, invites such radical new storytelling now? Um, gosh. Um, well, I think we use every tool at our disposal that we've got. Um, it doesn't have to be one size fits all, um, whether it's in film. Uh, I think film is a very powerful medium for, for storytelling. Um, but as is writing, as is, you know, each and every one has, a, has an access to those things. Somebody actually asked me the other day in, on a call about what role do artists uh, and creative people have a role to play in this process of transformation? And I said, absolutely every, you know, they're, they're, they're front of stage in a sense. Um, and, we, and we need them. Um, is um, is what I believe. I'm not sure that answered all of the question, but it was a, a slightly longer one uh, for me. Um, is there something else I need to address there? I'm very happy to. Um, there is an issue here, Alan, of othering. We enable ourselves to be othered. Do you know what I mean? We, to be enemified. Um, when the great stories, someone said to me uh, the other day, mm. why Avatar was a really interesting movie. Um, and it could be for a number of reasons, but they said, you know, what's really interesting about that movie is in any movie show, whether people were right wing or left wing in terms of their political persuasion, they all wanted the people to survive. Mm. They, they didn't side with the baddies. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I'd never thought of it like that, but it just goes to show that, that there is some quality that we all need which is probably to do with those things you talk about, kindness, generosity, transparency, which only by being that can other people stop seeing you as an enemy and therefore regard you as being not somebody yeah. to be othered, but somebody yeah. to be actually taking account of. This is absolutely, it's a very important point. And I, I knew I'd missed something and I, I agree with you. Um, it's very easy to other people. Um, what I've come to feel very strongly about in the last few years is actually from a, from a perspective of, 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 an, of being an, an Englishman um, and uh, what has happened as a consequence of over the, say, the last few years is we've othered a lot of people. We've never actually come to terms with our colonial past. Um, we're very good at pointing to all sorts of other people. Um, and, um, and that's how you create division. Um, and power bases are built on on the, on the back of it, and um, you know, really, there's not been a single politician, realistically, in my mind, that's really stood on that stage and done the job they should do when they mouth the words, "We all need to come together. We all need to be one." Um, they continue systemically um, to other people. Um, and it makes me very angry. I mean, I feel this because I have had the benefit to travel extensively uh, around the world uh, as a younger man. And what I realised was, is, you know, everyone wants a roof over their head. Everyone wants food on the table. Everyone wants to be able to kind of make their lives better for their, for their children. Um, 
what I find most ridiculous when you watch at some of the more extreme elements of uh, fundamental views of the world is actually they all want to commune around something. Um, and I think it needs a great deal of elegance and storytelling in terms of actually to show that universality. And um, all I can say is, is that, you know, when I wrote the first book and I really wrote it for myself because of a very dark place I was in at the time in part, um, is beauty was the way that I wrote my way home. I wrote it for myself. I didn't write it for anybody else. What I came to discover was is actually the way that I wrote that book spoke to a lot of people in a way that was open and invitational. Um, and it led me to believe there was something very important in this work to be done. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Great. I think maybe we'll take one more question and then, uh, Alan, if you're happy, I'll, uh, I'll forward you the chat from tonight as well. Because sure. there's some things there. There's some great things cropping up here that, you know, that, that could go on for a great deal longer. <laughs> about joy as well as, uh, as well as beauty. And what about joy and play as well as beauty? So I, I know we could, you know, well, I mean, that's back to, so that goes back to this, this question when, um, you know, I sat across a table with a very big lawyer in a very big law firm um, a number of years ago, and with his arms folded, he said to me, so tell me, Alan, what can beauty give the language of sustainability? And he thought he had me in a corner, you know, it's like, aha, uh, I've given you my best move. And I said, it's really simple. I said, sustainability doesn't talk about joy. It doesn't talk about wonder. It doesn't talk about nurture. It doesn't say, talk about all the things that are really important um, in terms of us. And that's, the, that's for me the problem with the language of sustainability is that it, it comes with a moral coding which is deeply rooted that if I'm going to try and persuade someone and uh, you know, in terms of that storytelling it is always a form of seduction. Um, if someone's going to start pointing their big finger at me and, and telling me that I've got to stop doing this stiff stuff because it's not right, I'm going, to have, I'm, going to, I'm going to react to that in a way. We've got to do something much more. And that's where I think, as I said, at right at the beginning of, the, of the, this conversation with Tim was just that for me, beauty absolutely just unfolds in a way uh, that allows us to see that there is so much potential that we can have that is being offered, that we can harvest, that we can sow, that we can grow, that we can make and that we can create, if we see it within that context. But for God's sake, you know, if you're going to wake up in the morning and all you've got to do is think about stopping stuff, I mean, what's the point of getting out of bed? Um, you know, we want something which is going to give us a skip in our step and, uh, you know, butterflies in our stomach and joy in our heart. Um, and all of that stuff is the stuff that makes life worth living, as far as I'm concerned. All right, so here, here. Remember always, our, our, someone we both uh, highly rate, um, uh, my friend Bill McDonough, he came to speak at the Royal Society for us last year and he opened his speech, great he was. I, I won't try to copy his drawl. He said, um, he said, I'd really like to know, he said, if I had described your relationship with your girlfriend as sustainable, how excited are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how he began. It was great. I, and he he says something which you do, and I I I I I actually wish it was on the inside front cover. He said, "What on earth is wrong with us that we've developed all sorts of cultures in which we want to talk about doing less bad?" When yeah. you look at all of that, the ESG stuff and the CSR stuff, all those acronyms of joy, um, he says, why don't, why, why do we not talk about doing good? I mean, why do we not set the standards that we're trying to aspire to, to be about good? Yeah. Yeah. And everybody understands that universally, yeah. I think. Yeah. Back to Iris Murdoch. I, absolutely. Well, I'm never going to thank Iris Murdoch. Never, ever, ever. <laughs> she nearly killed me. At university, I thought that I was clever. What a mistake. I was reading archaeology and I thought I'd do a side bit of moral philosophy. And I read that book and I didn't even understand the preface. I was completely calm. My tail went between my legs and I knew from that moment on that I was destined to be an ignoramus. Well, uh, you're a clever it, clogs, aren't you? You're from well, that Cambridge, <laughs> isn't you? <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, it's where I live. It's not where. I, it's, yeah. Well, anyway, anyway. I know. 
Um, yes. So we've got we've got we've got all sorts coming, and I'll send them to you later. Um, a lot of congratulations, Alan. Lots of people saying they've ordered the book here. Um, Great, fantastic. As a final as a final comment here, perhaps with a question to ponder or perhaps to address now is, congrats, Alan and Tim. Uh, ordered the book, but what do we do next? As well as asking our companies to re be regenerative, who leads us to the sunny uplands? Well, um, we're working on a, a way of how we can develop that book into practice, and that's important. Um, so I'm very open to uh, talk to people about that. Um, and, um, you know, there's a wonderful kind of group of people that we've got together where we can actually turn that book, which is essentially a story and a theory of change into how, so how you can make that happen. So I'm very open to have that dialogue with people if people want to do that. Wonderful. So, I mean, do, do, do uh, you know, do have a look at, at the Eason Project website for all the things that Tim and, and Eason have coming up because there's always fascinating things there to discover. Also, um, as Alan said, he's very happy uh, to talk to people and there's a course currently on the site you can register your interest for on the Hawkwood website. I'll, I'll make the questions and all the comments available to Tim and, uh, and to Alan afterwards and, um, and also have a look at the rest of the Do Books uh, website as well because there's some wonderful things yeah. there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Final comment, final comment for me is just a big thank you to Miranda West um, and the Do Book team because uh, without you... I wouldn't be here having this conversation with Tim. And I also want to say a heartfelt thanks to Alicia and everyone at Hawkwood, uh, Matt, that have really enabled this to happen. Because again, you've enabled a conversation to take place, uh, which I think is very important. And without that, um, I would have been sitting around my kitchen table this evening, um, having supper on my own. So um, I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. Marvellous. Yeah, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you both, Alan and Tim, for joining us tonight. It's been an absolute honour to host you as part of our conversations that matter. I think you've prompted a lot of inspiration, a lot of curiosity, and hopefully a lot of joy for people too tonight. So um, a huge thank you, and we look forward to welcoming you back very soon, Alan, um, to Hawkwood to run a course with us. And Tim, as a very close friend of Hawkwood, we look forward to seeing you soon as well, I hope. Likewise, what a delightful evening and well done Alicia for, for organising it and well done Matt and hey superstar, we'll be speaking again very soon. Will. Yeah, Tim, thank you very much, I really enjoyed yeah. the conversation, it was great fun. I'm now off to feed the oldsters. Okay. Goodbye everybody, <laughs> right, okay. bye. 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 Thank you, bye. 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 bye.